It is forming of the two hip bones and the sacrum. It is divided into a greater pelvis above and a lesser pelvis below. The lesser or two pelvis has an inlet, a cavity, and out. This is the pelvic inlet or pelvic brim. It is bounded by the promontory of the sacrum posteriorly and by the linear terminalis on each side and in front. The linear terminalis consists of the anterior border of the area of the sacrum, the outward line of the ilium, the piston pubis, and the pubic crest. The genitals of the pelvic inlet are first, the antibody posterior or conjugate young. It is 11 cm and extends from the upper border of the sensitive pubis to the middle of the sacral promontory. Second, the transverse diameter from side to side. It is 13 cm and is wider than the transverse diameter of the outlet, which is 11 cm. Finally, the oblique diameter. It is 12 cm and extends from the annual pubic eminence of one side to the sacro-iliac joint of the opposite side. Fourthly, the diagonal conjugate diameter extends from the lower border of the sensitive pubis to the sacral promontory. This diagonal conjugate diameter is the diameter that can be measured clinically through the vagina. Normally, the sacral promontory cannot be reached by the examining the things, but if so, the pelvis is regarded to be contracted and may result in difficult labor. This is the pelvic outlet. It is bounded posteriorly by the apex of the coccyx and theory by the synthesis pubis, and on each side by the discalcid relatives and the safe root uterus ligaments. Its diameters are first, the antibiotic diameter extends from the tip of the coccyx to the inferior border of the sensus pubis. It is 13 cm, which is larger than that of the inlet. Second, the transverse diameter extends between the two ischial tubulosities. It is 11 cm and is less than that of the inlet. In holding the pelvis in the anatomical position, the anterior superior index spine and the pubic tubules should lie in the same vertical plane. In this position, the pelvic surface of the sensitive pubis looks upwards and backwards. The concavity of the sacrum moves downwards and forwards. The axis of the pelvic cavity passes through the inlet downwards and backwards. 
then downward and slightly forward. This axis represents the bird's pathway within the pelvis. Note that the subpubic angle is wider in the female than in the male. In the female it is 90 degrees and is like the angle between the thumb and index finger when abducted. While in the male the angle is 45 to 60 degrees and is like the angle between the abducted index and the middle fingers. The walls of the pelvis are formed of three layers which are first osteofibrous layer formed by the bones, the sacrotuberous ligament and sacrospinous ligament. And by the perineal membrane and the obturator membrane. The sacrotuberous ligament extends from the ischial fibrosity to the side of the sacrum. The sacrospinous ligament extends from the ischial spine to the adjoining parts of the side of the sacrum and side of the coccyx. The perineal membrane fills the gap between the sides of the pubic arch and the obturator membrane fills the obturator membrane. All these constitute the components of the osteofibrous layer. The second layer is the muscular layer which comprises the pyrotomous muscle on the pelvic surface of the sacrum, the osteolatal internus muscle on the side of the lateral pelvis, The sphincter urethane muscle and the perineal muscles extending between the sides of the pubic arch. The greater eni and the coccygeus muscles form the floor of the pelvis and are pulled together to the pelvic diaphragm. All these muscles are covered on their inner surfaces by the pelvic fascia which constitute the third layer of the pelvic walls. Now let us begin by the perineum. The perineum is the lower part of the pelvis below the pelvic floor. It is diamond shaped and is bounded anteriorly by the pubic symphysis, posteriorly by the coccyx, and on each side by the side of the pubic arch and the sacral tuberous ligaments. The perineum is divided by an imaginary line which extends transversely from the ischial velocity of one side to that of the opposite side. This line divides the perineum into two regions or triangles. Anal region or anal triangle 
lies posterior and contains the inner canal in the midline and the two isquorectal posti, one on each side. Second, the urogenital region or triangle lies anterior and contains the external genital organs and the superficial and deep perineal pouches. This is the anal region. This is the lower part of the anal canal which occupies of the lip with an rectal fossa on each side. This is the lower end of the coccyx attached to the back of the anal canal by the anocoxygeal ligament. The lower part of the anal canal is surrounded by the anal sphincters. Notice the circular arrangement of the muscle fibers of the external anal sphincter. This sphincter is formed of three parts arranged from below upwards as follows. The subcutaneous part is the lowermost part and lies directly under the skin. Second, the superficial part above the subcutaneous part. Thirdly, the deep part above the superficial part and is the deepest. On each side of the inner canal, lies an ischio-rectal fossa. This is the ischio-rectal fossa. It is well shaped and is filled by a pair of fat. It is bounded laterally by the obturation internal spot and its covering the fascia. In this fashion lies the podendal canal, which passes close to the ischial tuberosity. This is the podendal canal, running from the lesser sciatic foramen towards the deep perineal pouch. Its course is thus from the hind folds. It contains the pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal vessels. The nerve and the vessels enter the canal from the gluteal region where they cross over the ischial spine and the sacrospinous ligament, together with the nerve to obturate on interests, and are covered by the sacrotuberous ligament. This is the nerve to obturate on interests, which is the most lateral and crosses over the base of the ischial spine to enter the lesser sciatic foramen and sink into the obturator in germous muscle. This is the podendal nerve, which is the most medial and crosses over the sacrospinous ligament. This is the internal podendal artery in between the two nerves. The podendal nerve and the internal podendal vessels run through the podendal canal in the lateral wall of the top. Near the beginning of the canal, 
the older man gives off the inferior wickedness at one immediately to the external inner symptom in company with the inferior vector of this is the inferior vector of which arises from the internal pudendal of both branches cross the first step to a lateral to me near the beginning of the canal the pudendal name gives off the inferior vector name it runs immediately to the external anal sphincter in company with the inferior vector part this is the inferior vector part which arises from the internal pudendal part both branches cross the first one from lateral to me near the anterior end of the pudendal canal the pudendal canal is divided into two divisions which are the dorsal nerve of the penis and the perineal nerve this is the dorsal nerve of the penis which runs into the deep perineal pouch along the side of the pubic arch in company with the internal pudendal arch its further course will be seen later this is the perineal nerve passing to the superficial perineal pouch to supply the perineal muscles and the skin of the stone these are the supporter branches which are cutaneous in the terminal they are called the radial branches but again to the boundary of the sq vector cross this is the radial boundary formed by the radial mi muscle note that it is covered by the anal fascia lower down the median boundary is formed by the external anal sphincter the posterior boundary is an intersecting tubular sphincter with the overlying gluteus maximus now the anterior boundary is the posterior part of the perineal membrane with the muscles of the intestine the lateral wall is formed by the obturator internus muscle and the intestine the apex of the dorsum is the meeting of the lateral and the medial boundaries The base is formed by skin and the fascia on each side of the anal pouch. An axis in the pouch may open into the rectum or anal canal or come to the surface at the base of the pouch. An axis in the pouch may spread to the other pouch behind the external anal sphincter. Now let us move to the lower genital region. This is the lower genital trunk. It is filled by two spaces or pouches 
cool, superficial perennial pouch and deep perennial pouch in relation to the perennial membrane. The perennial membrane has the deep pouch deeper to it. and contains the central urethra and deep transversus perineari in addition to the membranous urethra. The membrane has the superficial pouch superficial to it. and contains the root of the penis which consists of the bulb of the penis in the midline and two quora, one on each side. The superficial pouch is covered superficially by the membranous layer of the perineum which is attached to the sides of the pubic arch on each side and to the base of the perineal membrane posteriorly. Above, it is continuous with the membranous layer of the anterior abdominal wall. Thus, the superficial pouch is closed posteriorly and on both sides, but is open anteriorly at the same pubes. In the radiometer, which lies in the bowel of the penis, the activated urine passes upwards in front of the same pubes to enter the anterior abdominal wall due to the membranous layer of the superficial fat. On the other hand, the deep perineal pouch is completely closed on each side by the sides of the pubic arch. Posteriorly and anteriorly by fusion of the perineal membrane with the pelvic fascia. The pelvic fascia covers the deep surface of the deep pouch forming its wall. Note that the two codental canals open into the posterior part of the deep pouch close to the side of the pubic arch. Now, let us move to the dissected cavity. This is the superficial perineal pouch. This is the bulk of the penis lying in the midline over the perineal membrane. The two quora lie one on each side. This is the membranous layer of superficial fascia of the perineum. It is attached on each side to the side of the pubic arch and posteriorly to the posterior border of the perineal membrane. 
The pouch is open at theory and the sensitive tubes. This is the bulb of the penis, covered by a sheet of muscle called the bulbous conjuosus muscle. The urethra traverses the bulb, which is called corpus spongiosum. This is the cut section of the penis, showing the corpus spongiosum with the spongy or benign urethra inside it. On the bottom of the corpus spongiosum lie two corpora tabernosa, which are continuous backwards with the two corpora of the teeth. Note the deep dorsal vein of the penis and dorsal arteries lie between the two corpora cavernosa. This is the crust of the penis along the side of the pubic arch. It is covered by a sheet of muscle called the ischial cavernosus muscle. Note that the perineal membrane lies deep to the bulb and the two corolla, that is to say, deep to the root of the penis. These are the scrotum nerves and vessels running inside the superficial perineal pouch to reach the skin of the scrotum. Note also that this mass which lies in the median plane between the bulb of the penis in front and the inner canal behind is called the perineal body or central tendon of the perineum. In this perineal body, all muscles of the perineum are inserted. is the suspensory ligament of the penis, extending from the front of the sensitive pubis to the junction between the root of the penis and its three parts. This is the perineal membrane now clearly seen after removal of the bulb of the penis. It is a strong triangular fibrous tissue with its apex directed forwards and its base directed backwards. Its apex is thickened and is separated from the sensitive pubis by an interval through which the deep dorsal vein of the penis enters the pelvis to join the prostatic plexus of veins. The perineal membrane is pierced by these structures. The urethra in the median plane, one inch behind the sensitive pubis. The internal polymeral artery and dorsal nerve of the penis pierce the membrane very close to the margin of the pubic arch, half inch from the synthesis pubis. the 
Ilya Khalti. And this is the right common Ilya Khalti. They arise from the terminal end of the abdominal aorta at the level of the lower border of the fourth lumbar vertebra. This is the inferior mesenteric artery crossing the left common iliac artery to become the superior rectal artery. This is the left common iliac vein running upwards and to the right crossing the midline to join the right common iliac vein at the level of the fifth lumbar vertebra to form the inferior vena cava. This is the left common iliac artery dividing into the external and the internal iliac divisions. This is the left ureter crossing the end of the left common iliac artery. In other words, it crosses the beginning of the external iliac artery. It descends down in front and parallel to the internal iliac artery. Notice that the internal iliac artery descends in between the ureter anteriorly and the internal iliac vein posteriorly. This is the external iliac artery. It is longer and wider than the internal iliac. It passes on the medial side of the source major muscle to leave the pelvis from under cover of the inguinal ligament. The external iliac vein is behind its proximal part, but medial to its distal part. Its beginning is crossed by the ureter, while its end is crossed by the vast deference. Remember that it has only two branches, which arise just proximal to the inguinal ligament. These are the deep circumflex iliac artery which runs lateral and the inferior epigastric artery which runs upwards and medially. This is the stump of the inferior epigastric artery which is now cut and has been described with the anterior abdominal wall. Notice that the vast difference passes just lateral to the inferior epigastric artery and it enters the deep inguinal ring. This is the site of the deep inguinal ring. This is the internal iliac artery. At the tip iliac joint, opposite the lumbosacral disc. It is short and rapidly divided into branches to supply the walls of the pelvis as well as the pelvic viscera. It is sent just behind and parallel to the ureter. It is related laterally to the external iliac vein and obturator nerve. The artery divides into anterior and posterior divisions. The branches of the internal iliac artery shows many variations and it is better to identify each branch 
from its course and destination. Let us start by the posterior division. This is the iliolumbar artery. It passes deep to the solus major muscle to reach the, the iliac fossa. These are the two lateral sacral arteries. which pass to the front of the sacrum, where each of which divides into two branches to enter the anterior four sacral foramina. This is the superior gluteal artery, which is the continuation of the posterior division. It passes between the lumbar sacral trunk and the first sacral nerve to enter the gluteal region through the greater sciatic foramen. To sum up, the branches of the posterior division are the aeolumbar, two lateral sacral, and the superior gluteal. Now, let us move to the opposite side of the pelvis to demonstrate the branches of the anterior division. This is the right common iliac artery. This is the right external iliac. And this is the right internal iliac. This is its posterior division, and this is its anterior division. The branches of the anterior division are the following. This is the obliterated umbilical artery. It passes forwards on the side of the pelvis, as a fibrosed cord which forms the lateral umbilical ligament. Its proximal part is still vacant and gives off the superior vesical artery to the upper surface of the urinary bladder. This is the obturator artery. It passes forwards on the side of the pelvis, just below the obturator nerve, and the both run together to enter the obturator canal. It gives off a pubic branch which ascends behind the superior ramus of the pubis to anastomose with the pubic branch of the inferior epigastric artery. Enlargement of this anastomosis forms the abnormal obturator artery in 30% of subjects. This is the inferior vesical artery. It runs to the lower part of the base of the bladder. It supplies the base of the bladder, seminal vesicles, prostate and the vast difference. In the female, it is replaced by the vaginal artery. This is the middle rectal artery. It passes medially to supply the rectum. Note that the rectum also gets the blood supply from the superior and the inferior rectal arteries. The superior rectal is the continuation of the inferior mesenteric, 
and the inferior rectal is a branch of the internal podendum. This is the inferior gluteal artery. It is one of the two terminal branches of the anterior division. It passes through the greater sciatic foramen to enter the gluteal region. This is the internal podendal artery. It is the other terminal branch of the anterior division. It also enters the gluteal region through the greater sciatic foramen. To sum up, the branches of the anterior division in the male are obliterated umbilical artery, obturator artery, inferior vesical artery, middle rectal artery, inferior gluteal artery and internal podendal artery. Now let us demonstrate the median sacral artery. It arises from the back of the lower end of the abdominal aorta and descends in the midline in front of the fourth and the fifth lumbar vertebrae to the front of the sacrum to end below at the coccyx. This is the peritoneum of the pelvis. In the main, the peritoneum is reflected from the anterior abdominal wall onto the upper surface of the urinary blood. This is the urinary blood. The peritoneum covers only the upper surface of the blood and a small area on the upper part of its posterior surface and is then reflected backwards to the front of the middle third of the rectum to form the rectovesical pouch. This is the rectovesical pouch which is occupied by loops of helium and the sigmoid cooling. Note that the lower third of the rectum is not covered by peritoneum as compared with its upper two thirds which are covered by peritoneum on the front and sides but not behind. On each side of the rectum the peritoneum covers the wall of the pelvis forming the pararectal fossae. Similarly, on each side of the bladder, the peritoneum covers the floor of the pelvis to form the pararectal fossae. This is the left half of a male pelvis to show the arrangement of the pelvic organs. This is the ureter. Its whole length is 10 inches. It runs half of its course in the abdomen proper and the other half is in the pelvis. In the pelvis, the ureter descends and first vertically on the side of the pelvis just anterior to the internal iliac artery.
at the level of the ischial spine, the ureter changes its direction where it runs downwards and forwards on the floor of the pelvis. It then reaches the posterior superior angle of the urinary blood and penetrates its wall. The part of the ureter in the wall of the bladder is the intraneural part. And this is the near the northwest part. The ureter is related laterally to the external inner vessels up to the nerve and vessels, all of which run on the side of the pelvis parallel to the pelvic plate. At the postural superior angle of the bladder, the ureter lies between two structures which are the ductus deferens above and the seminal vesicle below. continuation of the tail of the epididymis. It ascends in the scrotum and in the inguinal canal. It enters the inguinal canal through the superficial inguinal ring. This is the inguinal canal and this is the vast difference passing through it. It enters the pelvis through the deep inguinal vein, where it is immediately lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Very close to its origin from the external iliac artery. This is the inferior epigastric artery and this is the vast difference just lateral to it. In the pelvis, the vast difference runs downwards and backwards on the side wall of the pelvis, where it crosses the external iliac vessels, obturator nerve and vessels, and reaches the postural superior angle of the urinary blood, where it crosses about the end of the ureter. and then runs downwards and medially in contact with the medial side of the seminal vesicle. Here it is dilated to form the ampulla of the ductus deferens. It joins the duct of the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct which pierces the process to open into the prostatic ureter. The structures on the base of the bladder are the two seminal vesicles with a ductus deferens medial to each seminal vesicle. This is the median part of the base of the urinary bladder. This is the prostate surrounding the neck of the blood. The prostate 
that's surrounded by fibrous sheath, which is much thickened posteriorly to form a thick septum called rectovarical fascia. In this fibrous sheath lies the prostatic plexus of veins, which receives the deep dorsal vein of the penis anteriorly. The prostate is attached to the back of the symphysis pubis by the pupil prostatic ligaments. These are two ligaments lying in the floor of the space behind the symphysis pubis, called retropubic space. This is the deep dorsal vein of the penis seen entering the pelvis immediately below the symphysis pubis to join the prostatic plexus of veins. The urinary bladder has a superior surface, two infralateral surfaces, and a posterior surface or base. This is the superior surface of the blood, which is covered by peritoneum. There is a ureter entering at each posterior superior angle of the bladder. This is the right ureter, and this is the left ureter. The two infralateral surfaces are one on each side. This is the right infralateral surface, and this is the left infralateral surface. They meet anteriorly where they join the superior cells to form the apex of the blood. This is the apex of the blood. It is continuous with the median umbilical ligament, which is the fibrous the ureus. Note that the neck of the bladder lies only one inch behind the lower border of the symphysis pubis. Here, the prostate which surrounds the neck of the bladder lies directly over the superior layer of the deep perineal pouch, to which it is firmly fixed. It should be noted that the neck of the bladder is the most fixed part of the bladder, the same as the cervix of the uterus, which is the most fixed part of the uterus. This is the base of the bladder with the structures related to it. The two rather differentia and the two seminal vesicles. This is the urinary bladder opened to show its cavity. This is the posterior wall of the bladder seen from inside. Notice the nicola which shows irregularities and a transverse ridge which extends between the two ureteric orifices. This is the internal ureteral orifice. And this small elevation just behind it is called the uvula.
and is produced by the median law of the Prophet. The triangle made by the two ureteric orifices above and the internal ureteral orifice below is called the tribunal of the blood. Notice that the semicolon is smoother than that of the blood and is middle in origin as compared with the rest of the mucosa of the bladder, which is endodermal in origin. The trigone is more sensitive and more vascular than the rest of the mucosa. This is the intramural part of the oil, leading to the interurethanic ridge. This is the vessel lying on the lateral surface of the sacrum. It begins opposite the third sacral segment as a continuation of the sigmoid cool. And ends one inch below and in front of the coccyx where it is continuous with the anal canal. The upper third of the rectum is covered by peritoneum in front and on the sides. The middle third is covered by peritoneum only on the front, while the lower third is marked third and four sacral nerves, and runs in company with the internal pudendal artery. Now let us demonstrate the female genital organs. These are the two ovaries, the uterus, the uterine tubes, the vagina, and the bone. This is the left ovary. This is the left uterine tube in the three border of the broad ligament. This is the body of the uterus. And this is its fungus. This is the right uterine tube. And this is the right ovary. This is the cervix of the uterus. This is the vagina. This is the urinary bladder lying in front of the vagina and uterus. And directly behind the sensitive pubes. This is the retro pubic space between the synthesis pubis anteriorly and the bladder posteriorly. This is the parietal peritoneum reflected from the anterior abdominal wall onto the superior surface of the urinary bladder. Let us continue with the reflection of the pelvic peritoneum. The peritoneum is then reflected from the superior surface of the bladder 
onto the lower or anterior surface of the uterus, where it forms the utero basilical pouch. Notice that the base of the bladder lies in contact with the upper part of the vagina and with the trunk of the cervix and is not covered by the vitrine. This is the blood, the urinary blood. This is the ureter. And this is the base of the blood. Here is the anterior wall of the vagina. This is the cervix of the uterus. And this is the body of the uterus. This is the pelicanium which comes from the upper surface of the bladder directly to the lower part of the front of the body of the uterus, leaving the cervix bare. The pelicanium then extends upwards to cover the fungus of the uterus. And it is followed downwards on the upper surface of the uterus and the back of the cervix down to the upper quarter of the vagina. From here, the peritoneum is reflected on the front of the middle third of the rectum to form the rectouterine pouch or Douglas pouch. Note that the anterior surface of the cervix is devoid of peritoneal covering. And this is in contrast to its posterior surface which is covered by peritoneum. This is another specimen of female pelvis showing the peritoneum reflected from the upper surface of the bladder to the front of the uterus, forming the uterus vagal pouch. And this is the rectal uterine pouch behind the uterus, between it and the rectum. Notice also that the rectal uterine pouch is directly related to the posterior phonics of the vagina. This is the vagina open. And this is its posterior wall. And this is the posterior phonix. It is possible to drain pus accumulating in the recto-uterine pouch through the posterior phonix of the vagina. The peritoneum is stretched laterally on each side of the uterus to form the broad ligament. This is the next broad ligament which extends transversely from the side of the uterus to the side of the penis. It is formed of two layers, a lower layer and an upper layer. Both are continuous together at the free border of the ligament. It will be described in detail soon. This is the left ovary. It lies in the lesser pelvis just below the brim of the pelvis in a fossa called the ovarian fossa. This is the ovarian fossa, which is bounded by the obliterated umbilical artery 
and the external iliac vessels from below and in front. And by the ocean and the internal iliac vessels from behind and above. The obturator nail passes from behind the forwards lateral to the over. The ovary is small in size, measuring 3 cm in length and 2 cm in width, and is attached to the upper layer of the broad ligament by a fold called the mesial variant. through which the ovarian vessels and lymphatics pass to the ovary. The ovary is also attached to the side wall of the pelvis by a fold of ovarian called the suspensory ligament or infundibular pelvic ligament of the ovary. The ovary is also attached to the lateral angle of the uterus by the ovarian ligament, which is derived from the uterinaculum of the uterus. Thus, the three ligaments are attached to the ovary arc the mesovarian, which is a part of the broad ligament, the suspensory ligament of the ovary, connecting it to the side wall of the pelvis, and the ovarian ligament, which connects the ovary to the side of the uterus. The ovary is covered by the peritoneum except at the mesovarian. And in ovulation, the ovum penetrates the cortex of the ovary as well as the common hypotonium to enter the uterine tube. Note that although the ovary is a pelvic organ, its lymphatic drainage goes to the aortic lymph nodes and not to the pelvic nodes. Its artery comes directly from the aorta at the level of the second lumbar vertebra and its vein drains into the inferior vena cava on the right side and into the left venal vein on the left side. This is the uterine tube. It runs laterally from the side of the uterus within the three borders of the broad liver. Its part just lateral to its entrance into the uterus is called the isthmus and is narrow and cold like. It forms the medial part of the tube. The lateral part of the tube is wider and tortuous and is called the ampulla. It ends laterally by a funnel shaped expansion called infundibula, in the bottom of which lies the abdominal opening of the tube. This opening is surrounded by several processes called the fimbri. These are the fimbri. This is another specimen showing the opening of the uterine tube into the uterine cavity. This is the isthmus. And this is the white ampullary part, which ends by the fimbri. These are the fimbri, which is around the abdominal opening of the uterine tube. This is 
the abdominal opening. This is the uterus. It lies between the rectum posteriorly and the urinary bladder anteriorly. It consists of a fungus, a body, and the cervix. This is the fungus. It is the upper part of the uterus, about the level of the entrance of the uterine tubes. There are two ligaments attached to the fungus on each side, exactly at the entrance of the uterine tube. These are the ovarian ligament behind the entrance of the uterine tube and the round ligament of the uterus in front of the entrance of the tube. The ovarian ligament passes close to the superior wall of the broad ligament, while the round ligament of the uterus passes close to its inferior wall. The round ligament is derived from the duodenum of the fetus, the same as the ovarian ligament. Note that the duodenum in the female fetus gets attached to the side of the uterus at the entrance of the uterine tube and consequently become divided into the ovarian ligament and the round ligament of the uterus. This is the body of the uterus. It extends from the level of the entrance of the uterine tubes to the cervix. It has an anterior or a lateral cervix, which is related to the urinary blood, and a posterior or intestinal surface, which is related to the sigmoid pool and the coils of ileum. Its lateral margin gives attachment to the broad ligament and is directly related to the uterine artery where it is tortuous in this part of its course. This is another specimen showing the uterus open glencoronally. This is the fungus about the level of the entrance of the uterine tubes. This is the body of the uterus. And this is the cervix opening into the vagina through the external os. And opening into the uterine cavity through the internal os. The cervical canal lies between the internal os and the external os. The part of the cervix projecting into the vagina is the vaginal part why its part above the vagina is called the supravaginal part. The vaginal part is surrounded by the vaginal phonesis on both sides, the anterior fornix anteriorly the posterior fornix, which is the deepest posteriorly, and a lateral fornix on each side. Note that the junctional zone between the body of the uterus and its cervix is called the isthmus, and this isthmus, the largest during the residency, to form what is called the lower uterine segment. 
The body of the uterus measures to three inches in length and two inches in width. While its cervix is one inch long and one inch thick. Note that the uterus is normally anti-flexed and anti -velvet. Now anti is meant that it, the body of the uterus is flexed anteriorly on the cervix. And by anti is meant that the body and the cervix together are bent anteriorly on the vagina. If they are bent posteriorly, the uterus is called retrovertebrate. The ligaments attached to the body of the uterus are the broad ligament, the round ligament, and the ovarian ligament. This is the ovarian ligament. It extends to the ovary and has been demonstrated earlier. This is the broad ligament. It is formed of two layers of peritoneum. An upper layer and a lower layer. The dense connective tissue present between the two layers is called parametric. The ligament has a free anterior border which encloses the uterine tube and the posterior border which is attached to the floor of the pelvis and is called the root of the ligament. It has also a medial border attached to the side of the uterus and the lateral border attached to the side wall of the pelvis, where it crosses the external iliac vessels umbilical artery and obturator nerve and vessels. The ligament has an upper surface which is related to coils of intestine and the lower surface related to the renal bladder, especially when Notice that the uterus and its two broad ligaments form a transverse partition in the cavity of the pelvis between the bladder anteriorly and the rectum posteriorly. The broad ligament is subdivided into four parts called mesovarium. Mesoserpings, mesometrium, and suspensory ligament of the ovary. This is the mesovarium, which is a long position of the upper layer of the broad ligament to which the ovary is attached. This is the mesocerpics, which is the part attached to the whole length of the uterine tube. It is the anterior part of the ligament. 
This is the mesometry, which is the part attached to the side of the uterus. That is to say, the medial part of the broad ligament. This is the suspensory ligament of the ovum, which is the most lateral part of the broad ligament, extending from the infantilum of the uterine tube to the side wall of the pelvis, which is also called the infantilum pelvic ligament. The contents of the broad ligament are mainly two tubes, two ligaments, and two arms. The tubes are the uterine tube, which passes the free anterior border, and the ureter, which passes in its attached posterior border. In the root of the ligament, the ureter passes from behind the folds, only one inch lateral to the cervix, and is crossed by the uterine artery from lateral to medial. arteries are the uterine artery and the ovarian artery. This is the uterine artery, which arises from the internal iliac artery and runs medially in the root of the broad ligament. Crosses the ureter and then ascends on the side of the uterus where it has a tortuous course. As it reaches the uterine tube, it turns laterally below it and runs parallel to it to anastomose with the ovarian artery. This is the right uterine artery running upwards along the side of the uterus with a tortuous course till it reaches the medial end of the uterine tube where it turns laterally below and parallel to it. On the side of the cervix it gives a descending branch which supplies the cervix and the vagina. These are the ovarian vessels passing through the suspensory ligament of the ovary. To enter the mesovary, the artery passes medially to anastomose with the termination of the uterine artery. The two ligaments, which are part of the contents of the broad ligament, are the ovarian ligament in contact with its upper layer, and the round ligament of the uterus in contact with its lower layer. To sum up, the two tubes within the broad ligament are the uterine tube and the ureter. The two arteries are the uterine artery and the ovarian artery. And the two ligaments are the ovarian ligament and the round ligament of the uterus. This is the round ligament. It passes through the broad ligament to reach the deep and wide vein, where it hooks around the lateral aspect of the inferior epigastric artery as the case 
of the world different in the name. The wrong development then runs in the inguinal canal and comes out through the superficial inguinal ring to be attached to the subcutaneous tissue of the labial measures. This is the inguinal canal open and this fibrous cord is the round ligament of the uterus going to the labial mares. This is the heliointuinal nerve passing along its side. The cervix of the uterus is the most fixed part of the uterus. The strongest ligament attached to the cervix is the Mackenroth's ligament which is a transverse ligament consisting of dense fibrous tissue surrounding the pelvic vessels which extend from the side wall of the pelvis laterally to the bladder, the vagina, the uterus, and the rectum medial. This is the Mackenroth ligament or transverse ligament of the uterus. This is the vagina. It is a tube 8 cm long and it is lined by stratified squamous epithelium. It opens into the vestibule of the vagina by an opening which is guarded by the hymen. This is the remnant of the hymen. The vagina is directed upwards and backwards and is directly related anteriorly to the urinary blood and the urethra. and is related posteriorly to the rectal uterine pouch, rectum, and the perineal body from above downwards. This is another space showing the urethra open longitudinally, and is seen adherent to the anterior wall of the vagina. This is the external urethral orifice, and this is the internal urethral orifice. This is the posterior surface or base of the urinary blood. It is also adherent to the anterior wall of the vagina, and this explains how the bladder can herniate through the anterior wall of the vagina to form what is called cystocele. This is the ureter, descending downwards and forwards and medially, and the floor of the pelvis. It comes close to the side of the cervix where it is one inch apart. Here, it is crossed by the uterine artery. The ureter then continues on the side of the upper part of the vagina and then in front of it, especially on the left side, to enter the urinary blood. 
This is the vaginal artery. This is a branch of the internal iliac artery. It replaces the inferior erector artery in the male. It supplies the vagina together with some other branches coming from the uterine artery and the medial rectal artery. This is a vaginal branch which descends from the uterine artery. And this is the urinary bladder open. And this is its neck. These are the pupovasical ligaments stretched between the front of the neck of the bladder and the back of the sinus pubis. This is the vagina immediately behind the urethra and the blood. This is the radiator ani muscle lying on the side of the pelvis and this is its anterior free border. Notice that these most anterior fibers of the levator MI get attached to the side of the neck of the bladder as well as to the side of the vagina where it forms what is called the sphincter vagina. This is a hemisection to show the parts of the bulb. It comprises the two labia major, two labia minor, clitoris, and the orifices of the vagina and urethra. This is the labia major. It is a sort of hairy skin filled with fat. The cleft between the two labia majora is called the potential cleft. This is the labia minor. It is a thin fold of the skin devoid of fat and hair. The labia minor lies to the inside of the labia major. The cleft between the two labia minora is called the vestibule of the vagina. This is the external urethral orifice, which lies immediately above to the vaginal orifice and is only one inch below the symphysis pubis. <laughs> 